Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Once again, Alhamdulillah, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for allowing us to come here on a Jummah. Now, Jummah in the most 10 blessed days of the entire year. And I thank all of you who are here today. And to those, inshallah, who are listening at home on Zoom or Facebook, uh, the masjid is open, as you know, and it was such a joy to be here last week and I see the same alhamdulillah smiling and happy faces that Allah reward us in these blessed blessed 10 days to those of you at home consider coming to the masjid because there is some room here inshallah you find that people register and then some don't show up so I'm encouraging you all to take up this option uh, especially since we're in this very very blessed time of the year which is part of the reason we wanted to open the masjid uh, in the month of Dhul Hijjah um, one of the things I wanted to mention is, as you know, inshallah, next Juma is going to be Eid al Adha. And we've been trying very hard from the perspective of the management of the board at ICB Wayland to find a solution because the masjid would not be able to manage with the kind of crowds that we have. Just so that you're aware, we have been out to an outdoor spaces like New Park, Castle Island. We went to DCR, which is the registration. So they are unable to try and accommodate at this time the number of people that we have. The other thing that we did is that we went to the Wayland Public School, the Wayland High School. Alhamdulillah is a very large parking lot. And we considered praying with the cars. You park your car and you pray next to the car. We've gone all the way up to the superintendent of school. But it seems that at this time they are a little reluctant also to, to accommodate us at this stage. They have not definitively given us a no. So if something works out, inshallah, you will hear by email. Otherwise, there will inshallah be a program on Zoom for Eid. And we will encourage you all to pray at home. As you know, this is also part of the Sunnah. You can pray at home during the prayer. Uh, there will be some accommodation made for khutbah. But the Jummah will still be on. And the Jummah is part, as you know. And this, the Masjid, the, the Jummah Salah will still be on next Friday. So the same kind of process, the same registration will take place. Which is something that I wanted to, to highlight to you. I take this opportunity uh, to thank everybody who's been working so hard, all the volunteers who have helped to put this on, and all the poor volunteers who work with, uh, with the IT as well. In that regard, I'd like to thank our Khatib today, uh, Dr. Sharif al Kudui, who you all know, inshallah, from Brandeis, he's an uh, associate professor of Islamic studies and, uh, and Arabic, and we welcome him to the masjid today. He's such a, a wonderful, wonderful resource for all of us, and the dear and beloved brother. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Allah, 
سوره المطهرين الله سبحانه وتعالى سوره البقره فاستبق الخيرات ways to do that which is good so in this season the roads leading to goodness are numerous and so we should not miss out on any of them the intelligent ones are those who exhaust themselves during this season to gain abundantly on the other hand we see those who put all of their efforts in the attainment of worldly gains but when it comes to matters of the hereafter they are heedless and the sad fact my brothers and sisters is that this the result of our all our efforts for the sake of this world would at most be the doubling or tripling of our capital and many times we actually lose it as for the wise believers nothing is dearer to them than increasing their efforts and righteous deeds that please our lord subhanahu wa ta'ala that get us closer to him and that our raise our ranks in his eyes so what are some of the deeds that we can do in these 10 days in order to take advantage of this enormous opportunity that Allah has laid before us one of these deeds is prayer of course we have our five daily prayers but this is a time to also increase in one's ibadah in various ways so uh, this is a very good time to do optional prayers and to do optional uh, the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said salat is the best thing that one can do so perform as many as you possibly can this of course goes beyond the five obligatory prayers uh, and tabarani reports that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam also said two light rak'ahs so two rak'ah cycles of prayer which you may deem insignificant to add to your deeds is better for you than possessing the whole world so we should not underestimate the value of doing extra prayers especially when the intention is pure to do them for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, Abu Huraira uh, also said reported that the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the son of Adam could, do, could not do anything more beneficial for himself than salat prayer reconciliation between people and being well mannered i mean cultivating high akhlaq good character traits so these three things also we should pay special attention to in these days extra prayer, prayer reconciliation between people who have had a falling out people who are, who are at odds with each other if there is some rancor or enmity between ourselves and any of our brothers and sisters we should try to make special efforts during these 10 days to put that right and if we have other people that we know that are close to us that we can also try to effect a reconciliation between them and those with whom they have had a falling out we should also try to do that if it is possible and then being well mannered or cultivating high fulu this is one of the most important things in islam that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that the best of you is the one who's best in akhlaq the one who has the best character the best interaction with other people who treats other people the best So in addition to prayer there is also fasting of course one of the main acts of ibadah that we do as muslims and we know that it was the practice of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to fast on mondays and thursdays and also to fast on the three middle days of the month the so called white days and ayam eid the 13th 14th and 15th of the lunar month and he also told us sallallahu alaihi wasallam fast the day of arafah which is next thursday um so there doesn't seem to be any specific uh, hadith or report about fasting all of the 10 days of dhul hijjah but one is of course invited to fast as many days as possible because fasting for the sake of Allah is a primary act of worship and good deed and as we said before good deeds are multiplied many times in this month so if one wants to fast all 10 days one may or all 9 days before he one may do so if one doesn't then at least try on monday and thursday so uh, next monday and the next thursday of course is the day of arafah and everybody plus there is a really strong reason not to should try to fast on the day of arafah because it's very meritorious to fast on that day and prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did specifically instruct us to fast on the day of arafah and as we know the day of arafah is the day on which the pilgrims are gathered on the plain of arafah and where they spend the entire day Uh, making dua and supplication to Allah and praying for forgiveness for their sins and this is a prefiguring of the day of judgment when all mankind will stand on a similar plane 
and waiting for the judgment to come. And so we who are not in Hajj should endeavor on that day to fast and then also to spend much time in istighfar and asking Allah for forgiveness. Also, uh, uh, giving in charity. Of course, uh, charity, sadaqah, is one of the most meritorious acts that a Muslim can perform. And so similar uh, to in Ramadan, giving charity, specifically in these 10 days of Rukhijjah, is something that is love and that will be multiplied uh, manifold, manifold, inshallah, by Allah's grace and generosity. So regarding the day of Arafah specifically, which is next Thursday, Abu Qatada reported that the Messenger وسلم, said, fasting the day of Arafah expiates the sins of two years, the past one and the coming one. And fasting on the day of Ashura expiates the sins of the past year. Aisha anha reported that the Prophet وسلم, said, there is no day on which Allah frees people from the fire as he does on the day of Arafah. He comes close and then boasts to his angels, what are these people seeking? Uh, and so all, obviously offering a sacrificial animal on the day of Eid itself is one of the most virtuous deeds that one can perform. And the Prophet وسلم, said, he who does not offer a sacrifice while being financially able to, to do so, let him not come close to our masjid, i.e. let him not pray with us. So these are examples of virtuous deeds, extra prayer, extra fasting, extra charity, fasting and asking for forgiveness, particularly on the day of Arafah, making the sacrifice on the day of the Feast of Sacrifice, which is the day of Eid, and Friday, inshallah, and also trying to bring about reconciliation between people and improving one's character and one's Allah, particularly during these days and then beyond. So we should take advantage of these days in order to increase in good deeds, both in the manner manners that I have mentioned, and in any other manner, because there's no restriction, any good deed is, re is rewarded multiple times during this uh, period, and so we are encouraged to perform good deeds of all kinds. I only mentioned the most prominent ones, but good deeds are innumerable, and so we should strive to seek them out and to perform them. And we should try to be aware of laziness and neglect, particularly during this time, and know that Allah has favor in certain seasons and times over others, and so it behooves us to take advantage of these opportunities and increase our righteous deeds. Perhaps Allah may forgive us our sins and shortcomings. <laughs> So, in the last part of the khutbah, I wanted to, we've spoken about the first 10 days of Ruh Hijjah and what we as Muslims, no matter where we are in the world, can do in order to take advantage of these 10 days, and particularly those of us who are not currently at the Hajj. But of course, the specialty of these days is marked particularly by the Hajj itself, which takes place, as we know, on the 7th, 8th, and 9th of Dhul Hijjah. So next Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, Thursday being the day of Arafah, the day immediately preceding the Eid. And so we should think also about what is the Hajj all about, and what is the symbolism of it, and what is the importance of it, even for those of us who are not participating in it this year. Hajj, as we know, is one of the main pillars of Islam, one of the arkan of Islam out of the five pillars. And it is a requirement on every able-bodied believer once in his or her life, uh, anyone who is able to uh, make it there, both financially and physically. And in addition to this, the Hajj is a ceremony of love and devotion to Allah. A Muslim's relationship with Allah should be one of deep love, devotion, and obedience. We love Allah because He loves us. Allah says in the Quran, He loves them and they love Him in Surah Al Ma'idah. Prophet Ibrahim also loved Allah, and so Allah took him as a friend. Allah took Ibrahim as a special friend. 
sort of in the sand. Hajj, as we know, is deeply associated with Prophet Ibrahim salam, and his story. Hajj gives us a sense of history going back many thousands of years. Our faith is deeply rooted in history. This is the religion of Allah given to us by his many prophets, starting with Adam salam, our father and the first human being, and after him Noah, Nuh, Ibrahim, Ismail, and so on and so forth until the final prophet, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. These were all people who loved Allah and whom Allah loved and whom Allah made guides for humanity. Hajj also reminds us of the universal spirit of Islam. People of all races, colors, and nationalities go there. They become one people without any class or distinction. No class because everybody is dressed exactly the same. You cannot tell the wealthy from the poor, the privileged from the underprivileged. And there is no no distinction also in race because everybody mixes and everybody mingles. And everyone knows that when Malcolm X, uh, uh, may Allah be, be pleased with him, when he performed the Hajj in the last year, or second to last year of his life, that is where he saw what he considered one of the miracles of Islam. He said, I saw black and white together and everything in between, drinking from the same vessel and making Tawaf around the same Kaaba. And this is something he said I could never imagine in my own country which is the United States, particularly in those days. And so we should, uh, we should realize that Hajj is a symbol of the universality of Islam and of the fact that Allah says that he has made our tongues and our colors among the signs by which we can come to know him. And that the best amongst us are those who are best in piety and closest to Allah, which means there's no distinction to be made on the basis of color on the basis of race, on the basis of language, on the basis of ethnic background. And we all know this as Muslims, and on, on sometimes we actually do embody this as an ummah. And when we do, we are right to be proud of that by the grace of Allah, not proud in a prideful sense. But we should also not pat ourselves on the backs and be blind to the reality of racism among our own communities. And it's important to bring this up at this time because the country now here in the United States we're living through a period where there is heightened talk about racism after the violence we've seen, after the death of George Floyd and all of the protests that have taken place since then. And Islam, if anything, has the solution to this problem. But we as Muslims often do not live up to this reality. And we know within our own communities that there is racism in many different countries that we come from and among our communities right here in the United States. Right? And everybody knows what I'm talking about, and everybody knows the pecking order, and it's the same as you find anywhere else. The lighter your skin, the higher you up, up you are, and the darker, the lower you are. And this is something that is completely unacceptable for us as Muslims, in which the Prophet explicitly said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Arab is not superior to the non-Arab, nor is the non-Arab superior to the Arab. And a black man is not superior to a white man, nor is a white man superior black man, except by way of piety. The only relevant distinction in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the state of one's heart, the state of one's iman, uh, one's deeds, one's akhlaq, and these other things that we have mentioned that are of are moral and spiritual worth and value. And Allah says he does not look at our forms or our bodies, but he looks at our hearts and our deeds. In addition, Hajj gives us a focus, a center, and an orientation. Of course, we all turn to face the Qibla every day during our prayers. And this should remind us when the pilgrims are gathered at the Kaaba itself, that we should have only one Qibla for our worship. But in addition to that, we should have only one unity of purpose and mission in our lives. So the Kaaba is our center, not only during prayer, but it should be the center of our entire existence. Everything we do should be oriented around the Qibla, meaning oriented around Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the center of it. We should be God-centered and God-focused individuals all, all throughout our lives, not only on the special days of the year, and not only during the five times of prayer as well. So our fight, focus on, on our life in life is on Allah and the house of Allah, the Kaaba on this earth. And we have with us Allah's book that we must hold fast to together. Allah says to us in Surah Al-Imran, Hold together, all together tightly to the will of Allah and do not be divided. 
For Hajj, at its best, is a ceremony of peace and harmony. The pilgrims come in peace to spend their time together in the most peaceful and respectful manner. The idea is that people should come and should respect each other. Allah says, La rafatha wa la kusufa wa la jidad in Hajj. There should be no crude or rude behavior, no argumentation and disputation in the Hajj. So even for us, while we are not at Hajj, let us try to apply these standards to ourselves. Let us try to be extra careful in these 10 days, especially the days of the Hajj itself, 7th, 8th, and 9th, next Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, as if we are in the Hajj ourselves, right? Let us try to endeavor not to fight with people, not to argue, not to be rude in our behavior. We should be doing it anyway, but let's try to make an extra effort during that time so that we can partake of the benefits that the Hajj season has to offer us. And finally, and I'll end with this, Hajj is, first and foremost, above all else, is about sacrifice. We are commemorating the sacrifice that Ibrahim Salam was asked to make. And he was asked to make probably the most serious and most difficult sacrifice that a person can make. He was asked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to sacrifice his very own son. And this is, anyone who's a parent knows, this is more painful and difficult than even being asked to sacrifice yourself. Because to sacrifice your child is even more difficult than to sacrifice your own self. Because it is part of our fitrah, the nature that Allah created us on, to protect our children and to want to protect them at all costs, including the cost of our own lives. And so we, 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 we read in the Quran, I don't have time to read the verses, but, uh, but we have all heard them, I'll read quickly in English, when they had both submit, submitted, uh, Ibrahim and his son Ismail alayhi uh, salam, when they both had submitted and he flung him down upon his forehead, we, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, called unto him, O Ibrahim, who have fulfilled the vision, indeed you do thus more the doers of good. And so we have, look at what Ibrahim was asked to sacrifice. And when he turned to his son and said, I see in a dream that I'm to sacrifice you, what do you say? His son said, if I'm not told, do what you are commanded, and inshallah you will find me from the sovereign, those who are patient, those who have forbearance. Okay? So we, what is Allah asking us to sacrifice? Allah is asking us to sacrifice much, much less than what he asked, asked of our father Ibrahim alayhi He is asking us only to sacrifice our desires, only to sacrifice our whims, only to sacrifice our preferences, only to sacrifice our personal predilections. That's all he's asking us. And it feels like a lot sometimes because these things take over our lives. We want and we crave and we want to do this and that, right? This is also part of being a human being. But this is so little compared to the sacrifice that Ibrahim Al-Islam was asked to make. And when he was asked to make that ultimate sacrifice, he did so willingly and in complete submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and with the riba, good pleasure with the command of Allah. And when he asked his own son who he was supposed to sacrifice, what is your opinion of me sacrificing you? The son also said, do what you are commanded. Do so we have to ask ourselves, do we do what we are commanded? We are commanded and we disobey. Allah commands us and we turn away. Right? And, and, and the sacrifice he's asking us to make is simply the sacrifice of our nafs, the sacrifice of our shahwat, the sacrifice of our ahwat, our, our limbs and our desires, as we said before. And so we should turn back and ask, what are we sacrificing? Are we sacrificing properly in the way that Allah has asked us? Are we giving to Allah what He has asked of us? And if we, if we find that we are falling short, then we should take inspiration from our father, Ibrahim alayhi salam, who was ready and willing to make the absolute utmost sacrifice that a human being could be asked to give. And when we see what he was asked, when we compare it with what we were asked, we understand that Allah is kind and merciful, and he does not ask of anybody more than what that person can bear. As Allah says in the Quran many times, la Allah does not bear task a soul with a burden greater than it can bear. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma inna nas'aluka ridaka wa jannah wa na'udhuk min sahafika wa na'ud. Allahumma la tuzat kuyubana ta'fir inna baytana wa hamana minna kusra rahma inna ka anta al-wahab. Allahumma inna ibaduk, banu ibaduk, banu ibnaik, ma'udhu fina khutmuk, a'adhu fina qabauk. 
نسالك اللهم في كل اسم هو لك سميت به نفسك او انزلت به في كتاب في كتابك او علمته احد من خلقك او استاثرت به في علم الغيب عندك ان تجعل القران العظيم ربيع قلوبنا ونور صدورنا وجلاء احزاننا وذهاب همومنا وهمومنا لهذا الجلال والاكرام امتنا على دين الاسلام ووفق اللهم امور ولاة امور المسلمين الى العمل في كتاب الله والسنه في خاتم الانبياء والمرسلين صلى الله عليه وسلم. Allah we ask that you open our hearts during these 10 days of Al-Hijjah that you give us tawfiq to perform good deeds that will draw us closer to you. Good deeds that will earn your good pleasure and reward from you manifold. And we ask that you allow us to think and to reflect and to uh, imbibe the spirit and the message and the meaning of, these, of the season of Hajj. And we ask that you give us tawfiq and strength to and right guidance in order to sacrifice for your sake that which you have asked of us. I, I say this and I ask Allah to bless you all to accept our prayers. Fa'akimu salam. <laughs>